Hello gardeners and welcome to Mid-American Gardener where we talk plants all the time. Every one of us, all the time. So if you have a question, we may just get to you on some of the phone lines. I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department. So I'll handle perennials and cut flower questions, but I have three highly, highly intelligent, personable panelists with me. And so you might pay attention to what their expertise is and then they'll answer questions as well. Now let's start first with our gentleman on the far end, and this is Dave Plussard. Hi, Dave. Hi, Diane. I'm the garden center manager at Hare Nursery in Peoria. I'm also a certified arborist, so my specialty is trees and shrubs. And one of the things I brought with me today is this tricolor beach sample. And oddly enough, the tricolor is on the right side, and on the left side we have plain uh, leaves. They were purple when they first came out. And people will call and ask, now how can I have two different things coming out of my tree? And what's actually happening here is that the tricolor beach is developed because somewhere along the way somebody saw this developing on a beech tree and so they decided that they would take cuttings from it, take little buds and they would start it, they would propagate it and sell it kind of as a clone as a tricolor beech tree. But genetically it mutated and that's how it got its variegation. And sometimes plants will revert back to what they were originally and that's what's happening. This was a tricolor beech. It's in my front yard and I noticed the purple leaves coming out and realized that this tree is reverting back to what it originally was. And very often when a tree reverts like this, the reversion part, like the purple, will be much more vigorous than mm -hmm. the original. So it's very important that you cut something like this out or it will continue to grow and possibly take over. We'll see it in things like a dwarf Alberta spruce, other variegated plants. It's not really uncommon, but it does happen and it's a question that we get very often. Variegated sedums, yes. the green part will be much bigger. Mm -hmm. So is that a quad color beach then? And Why, yes, it has I, the, my, but I don't think it's highly desirable <laughs> to have for no, for it's not, and, and I wish I didn't have it, but I do. So was that most of it? Did you get take care of it? Or Actually, was there... Uh, there was one large w uh, branch last year. I cut it out. This year, there's some more, and then inspecting it for this show to bring a sample in, I found I found quite a bit, okay. various places throughout, and I happen to have two, but it's only occurring on one tree, okay. so not really sure why it's happening. So you have to be proactive to get it out of there you quickly. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, that's interesting. Thanks, Dave. Mm -hmm. And now we're we're going to go on to Karen Ruckles. Hi, Karen. Hi. Um, as Diane said, I'm Karen, and I uh, work at Hair Nursery, and I'd say I specialize in everything else that Ella and Dave, um, I get leftovers. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, tonight, or uh, what I want to talk about is um, buyer beware. And what I saw in the late summer this year is mass merchandisers not clearly labeling plants for all of us to understand about them. This plant on this side is uh, a nectar series of Agastanchi, uh, uh, hyssop. And um, this one on the left is called Wendy's Wish uh, salvia. Both of these plants, I was at places that sold them and had tags that said they were perennials. And it, it's very disconcerting to see that because these are zone seven. So like where we live in central Illinois, we're in the Peoria area, we're zone five-ish B, um, that these aren't gonna overwinter. So they are an annual, but yet where I found these sold, showed them as a perennial. So I just wanted to talk about that buyers beware. The one perennial or the one annual I saw in one place, it said it was hardy to, to minus 20 degrees, or not minus 20, I'm sorry, hardy to 20 degrees. Oh, to 20 degrees. To 20 and degrees. We get minus 20. And oh. we're 20, minus 20 in oh, zone okay. 5. And this other one was just saying it was a perennial. But um, Well, it is a perennial, possibly down, in Georgia. <laughs> or when I lived in North Carolina. North, North Carolina. Carolina. Mm -hmm. So further south. So it almost would be better to sell it as an annual and then have the occasional annual that would overwinter in right. a mild year. Right, yes. Than to think you have a, a row of perennials and they're dead. Right, so it's-, it's Good point, Watching Thank you. the labels and, and double checking. And being aware. 
Yeah. Good. Thank you, Karen. You did well in my perennials class. I can just <laughs> tell. <laughs> okay, yes, Karen was a former student of mine. And speaking of <laughs> former students, hi, Ella. The person next to me is Ella Maxwell, and I think you were in my first year of teaching. I, I was. Indeed, How exciting. Diane, thank you. I'm Ella Maxwell, and I also work at Hair Nursery. And uh, for my show and share today, I brought a pot-bound um, maple tree. And so you can see here that this tree was probably started as a, a young grafted tree in a five-gallon pot. And as it um, started to grow out, we can see that the roots hit the edge of the pot and were deflected back. And what that can do for maple trees with this aggressive fibrous root system is you can get these roots to become stem girdling roots. So it's towards the camera. Yeah, there, there we go. That. Oh, good. That dude is really. Yes. You can see to... that. That's could come. Well, it's dry now, but uh, <laughs> could come around. Uh, it is important that when you take plants out of the pot, that you loosen those roots. And if they are circling, you might have to remove some. Uh, it's much better to remove them and get new roots than to have something uh, become uh, damaging as the tree gets older. There's so many of them, and they're just, like you well, said, circling they're, back. They're curled around everywhere. So this is a problem when the tree is in the pot too long. Boy, that really shows it. And you can see what happened to it. That's it's right. It's not well. Not happy. Not happy. It died. <laughs> well, thank you all. And now we're going to go to our video mail and see what a viewer has for us. This is an auger from Mid-American Gardener. Just put it in like this and slowly go into your ground. And you get a beautiful hole that you can put another plant in. Take a look right here. Another hole. Excellent. Oh, a plant auger. I, use, I show that in class. And what do you plant with it? Have you had experience? I think we all have had experience using them. I didn't. Go ahead. Oh, I've planted bulbs with an auger. Um, it's a fast way to do it. Um, if the ground is moist, if there aren't a lot of roots, mm -hmm. um, it's easy. If it's dry and lots of roots, it doesn't work very well. I planted ground cover with it and it, it does work very fast. As you said, if it's rocky soil or something, it makes it a little bit more challenging. I have also used it when I am either fertilizing a tree or particularly wanting to do something like add sulfur into a soil where you really can't t um, churn the soil. So you can use an auger and then you can incorporate that into the soil using an auger. It works really easily that way. So it, it is nice in the fall, it, it works, and for plants, so it's yeah. kind of an interesting thing. Thank you, viewer, that was very good. We do have an address in case you wanna send us um, something you want us to ID or show a problem or just show a comment, something you use in the garden. So send it to yourgarden at gmail.com. Okay, let's go to the phone lines, and surprise, surprise, we have tomato questions coming up. Let's start <laughs> with line two about tomatoes. Hi there. Hello. What's your question? Hello. Yes, go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, <clears throat> my question regarding tomatoes is I'm having uh, quite a problem with them. Uh, I've had, I planted about 21, 22 plants, and uh, two or three of them, They've got tomatoes on, and all of a sudden they're just kind of wilting down and dying down. Uh, I think there might be three situations here. I have quite a bit of shade in my yard. And secondly, I've been watering them quite a bit, and I don't know. I've been putting like half a gallon to gallon of water on them every other day ever since I planted them, and I didn't know if it was something like that or if it was a soil. So I'm gonna hang up. What, wait a second. What are the plant like, symptoms? Yep. Are the leaves uh, browning or spotting, or is the fruit getting browning? What are the well, symptoms? Some of the, fruit on, some of the fruit on there has gotten ripened, but the three plants that are dying, they just no, they're just wilting. They're they're still green. They're just wilting, and uh, you know, like they're going to dry up, and which I suppose they will. But the other plants that I have got, all of them seem to be so spindly and not a lot of foliage on them, okay. but they have got some tomatoes on them. 
Okay, well, let's, we'll answer your question and we probably can all put a few, uh, two cents in. <laughs> That's yeah. right. My first two cents is, uh, <laughs> is that the plants are spindly because tomatoes need full sun for uh, lush growth and uh, good yield. So you might want to relocate your garden. So that would be number one. That could be, uh, attribute that to it. Um, my next sense worth in is <laughs> tomato plants have a very vigorous, good root system. I, I'm a little leery when you say you're watering them so much. Tomato plants doing good, thorough, deep watering, like you would maybe a, a, a small tree or a small bush, would be better off for those plants. And try not to get the foliage wet. And if you mm -hmm. have to use a sprinkler, do it in the early morning so they dry by nightfall. But, but I would say watering them with, if you've been seeing a lack of, of rain, maybe once a week of good soaking mm -hmm. and then letting it go. I, I, I think they pretty well hit it on the head because tomatoes don't require uh, a lot of water compared to probably some other plants. But one other thing is one of the problems they can have is a wilt disease. Fusarium uh, wilt would be one of them that they might have. That could be a possibility. And you can buy your tomato plants that uh, have been developed because they are resistant to some of those diseases. Uh, and that could be a possibility, but most likely it's probably due to the amount of sunlight as well as the watering that you're doing. And my f the fourth two cents, which makes eight cents now, um, <laughs> I would say make sure you have rotated those, you know, to a different spot every single year. Mm -hmm. Don't plant tomatoes in the same spot, mm -hmm. and that could make them also not thrive and could cause the fusarium yeah. issues. So anyway, there we go. So um, we enjoyed that tomato question, but we don't <laughs> enjoy that yours aren't doing well. So yeah. we want them to be doing well. Thanks so much. And then we're gonna to go to another tomato question, and this time on line three. Hi there. Line three, what's your question? Yes. Yes, what's your question? Yes, tomatoes. My tomato plants uh, are not doing at all well. I planted them early. I have 14 different varieties. Wow. And uh, they uh, have set on early. They set on and did well, and I got a few ripe ones. But now then they're at a standstill. I've got all kinds of green ones and none of them are ripening. Uh, you're just going to have to be patient. This is weather related. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had some very cool night temperatures, 53 up in our area. 49 in some places. Really? So mm -hmm. um, as soon as the night temperatures start to come back up, uh, you'll be getting more tomatoes than they'll be ripening quickly. But I've had several people comment that they have lots of tomatoes set and they're still green. Yeah. But, you know, if you want to have beautiful weather in the summer, sometimes tomatoes don't like the beautiful cooler weather. They like hot and dry like last year. Yeah. Well, they like hot. They don't like the dry. Yeah. So patience. Did you say yeah. patience? Patience. <laughs> right now. We want it right now. So that just, just wait. And then they're going to come on. I think we do get some warmth. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your question. It's nothing you have done. You just have to wait. Now, let's go um, to line four, and this is about moles. Line four. Well, good evening. Hi. First of all, we appreciate your program very much. It's very informative. Thank you. My mole problem is uh, the proverbial thing, but they look different this time. They are not making runs through the yard. They're making piles of dirt. So my, my first question is, uh, what's, why are they doing that? And uh, the follow-up part of it is my sister-in-law claims mothballs are wonderful. And I've kind of, from listening to the program in the past, kind of dismissed that as a possibility, but I did use them. And uh, one of the moles kicked the mothballs out and went right back to his hole. <laughs> That's um, interesting. That okay. That. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What are you guys' um, remedies for moles? Well, I, I think maybe from what I understand with the life cycle of moles, why you might see more mounding of soil is they might be building a den for raising young. And they typically go down deeper and um, will have two ways down into it. So you, that might be why. Um, you know, a, a family has started in your area. 
I think a lot of people have found, unfortunately, the drastic measures is the best measure of either using the traps and killing them, um, or now a lot of people are finding um, effectiveness with these um, poison worms. Mm -hmm. And I, I've heard a lot of people have good reports with that, but the problem is when you're in a high density, it seems like you, you do maybe kill off some and, and there's more right behind them. So I, I think it's a little scary with what numbers you might be dealing with. That makes sense about the piles because I have seen that a lot. Mm -hmm. Because the soil is moister this year than last year, so they're able to dig. Wow. Well, the density part was not encouraging, but, <laughs> but it's facts, isn't it? Wow. Okay, well, don't go away because we want to show you a special Did You Know? Stay tuned. remember those reports about assassin bugs from our entomologist yeah. and also the biting part so stay away all right well let's go back through and do some uh, viewer email do you want to start us off Dave I sure will I actually have three emails but they all deal with the same thing there's uh, a cut uh, people have called in or sent the emails in I'm sorry with fungus problems growing on their trees. And this particular one that you're seeing is growing on a sugar maple. They're wondering what is growing out of the tree and what should I do? The other one is on an ash tree and the third one is on, the, on a hackberry. And the hackberry uh, person actually indicated that it is it a fungus. And yes, it is a fungus that is occurring. And unfortunately, when you start seeing a fungus or a mushroom body coming out of the tree, that that is not a good sign whatsoever. The, the fungus is in the tree and there is no way to cure it and get it out of the tree. So it actually is going to be a case where the tree is going to be terminal at some point. Doesn't mean that the tree will die immediately, but there really is no control for it. And you're just going to have to, while the tree is, is still alive, continue to water it, try to keep it as healthy as possible. Might be a case where the tree would be able to wall it off itself, but probably unlikely. So in the case of a fungus growing with uh, mushrooms on the outside of the bark, that usually is a terminal case. And all different kinds of trees from the sounds of it. There are, yes, it happens on a lot. Okay, thank you. And now Karen. My question is uh, from a person asking about nimble wheel and how can I rid my lawn of nimble wheel? It is in patches at various spots in the yard. And uh, nimble wheel is, is a tough thing. It, it kind of looks grassy, but you get closer and it's got lots of little stems and little leaves on it. Unfortunately, there's not an easy control for this weed. Um, in your lawn, when it's actively growing or green, you are are only left with using like a uh, Roundup product where you would just completely kill off that ve vegetation and then you're going to have to, once that's completely dead, reseed or sod in that area, unfortunately. Or you can contact a lawn service, see if they can help you, but there's there's not an easy solution, unfortunately, with this. And, and it can take off pretty good in a mm -hmm. lawn. It's nimble. What oh, did sorry. I say? <laughs> and it grows by its own will. Yes, it okay. does. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Karen, for setting us up. All right. All right. Moving on to you quickly, <laughs> Ella. Yes. Um, my uh, calling question here is on hollyhock rust. Um, the rust is orange pustules that you'll see on the undersides of the leaves. The leaves become spotted. They can uh, begin to turn yellow and fall. But... Uh, the viewer is having problems with the rust and they want to know what they can do. If you just have a few, it might be best to sacrifice the one plant for the other good ones that haven't been treated. And then also there are some fungicide products out there that you could spray, but uh, the hollyhocks are biennial. Um, even with rust, they'll probably still be back next year. So far, I have some without a single spot on the leaf so minor spotless as well so. uh, minor spotty mine died 
Okay. okay. <laughs> well, that was a lovely survey we just made. <laughs> so I'm sure it's because we're great growers, says yeah. Dave. Wow, ours looks so good. Yes, I agree. <laughs> well, we're going to go to the phone lines, and let's go to line five, and it's a pear tree. Hi there, line five. Yes, uh, thank you for taking my call. You're welcome. I, I enjoy your program very much. Thanks. Uh, I have a pear tree that has uh, dimples on the fruit. It's not on all of them, but just uh, some of them. I was wondering what, what I can do to uh, rid this problem. Well, once it's uh, the fruit has been damaged, there's not too much you can do. There are um, sprays out there that you can follow a, uh, a timing of the, the product to help prevent any uh, insect damage to the fruit itself. Is this a pear tree? Fruit tree? Pear. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it yeah. doesn't necessarily mean that the fruit is ruined. Right. Uh, it's pro it could very well be more cosmetic. So you'll want to check the fruit before you uh, decide not to eat it. It, it may be fine. Uh, mm -hmm. We're so often used to seeing perfect fruit in the grocery store, but in the home garden, that's uh, very often is not the case, but doesn't mean that you uh, will not be able to eat the fruit at all. And that's very encouraging because mm -hmm. then you use less spray if you right. can exactly. take mm -hmm. some you know a little bit of flecking and blemishes right. mm -hmm. okay well let's go on to the next one and it's about a sugar tree a sugar maple tree a sugar tree <laughs> a sugar maple tree on line six hi there hi thank you very much for taking our call you're welcome we really appreciate your show uh, we have a sugar maple that's about 25 years old okay. probably 30 feet tall <clears throat> it's been beautiful up until the end of last year started losing some le losing some leaves. This year we have very few leaves on the inner portion of the tree. Out on the tips there are some leaves, but it looks like it's going downhill pretty fast. Any suggestions? Well, that um, can be a number of different things. It probably would be something that you're going to need to have a tree service look at um, if you can look at the tree and determine if there's enough uh, potential for the tree to recover. If it's gotten to the point where you're already lost most of the leaves, that's not encouraging. But uh, it would be difficult from our standpoint over the phone to try and determine what that very cause could be. Although Ella's earlier uh, show and tell where she showed girdling root, very often uh, problems occur. Uh, 90% of them below ground uh, when you can't see what's going on at the top and we don't always know what that problem is and very well could be something that is associated with the roots. Uh, it could be occurring in the trunk and if there's nothing you can see visually um, it may not be something that you yourself are going to be able to correct without professional help. Or, or until it does fail completely and you have to have it removed and then right. you can finally see the whole story that's unfortunately. very often awesome, true yeah so so there's your answer but it could be tense mm -hmm. so i hope it turns out i hope it's environmental but it very well may be something underground okay thank you very much for your call and let's go to an arborvitae question and it's on mm -hmm. line two hi there line two thank you for taking my call you're welcome it sounds like a night for trees we have a large tree in back of a row of arborvitaes. The arborvitaes are about 20 to 30 feet tall. And the contractor cut down the big tree and dropped the limbs, and they fell on the arborvitaes and broke limbs off. Would the arborvitaes reproduce limbs again, or once the limb is gone, it's gone? They'll make uh, limbs again. So you could... Uh, shear them or you'll see them fill in but slowly and um, it's something that unfortunately there was damage but they will grow out of it I, I would think so and you can kind of prune it to hide thin it, it at the t and hide it that's very good that's what, <laughs> I was, that's what I was trying to say very succinct to hide yeah. it yeah so that's good news I'm glad to, to have good news after maybe not so good news all right, well, are you ready for the quiz for right now? Let's go to it and see if you know the answer.
Did that trick you? What did you think it was? I was going to say garlic from biblical times. Wow. I would that... have said potato, uh, but I suspected it could be all mm -hmm. three. Yeah. Very I've interesting. I've had some potatoes that I thought were that old. <laughs> <laughs> well, you learn a lot on this show <laughs> trying to cover up for his comment. <laughs> well, I want to thank you for being here. Well, thank you. It was wow. really goes fast and we learn a lot. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for watching and remember send us a, a video if you want to and we will see you next time. Have a great week gardening. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.